Psalm 119. I encouraged uh, the folks that are on our Facebook group to, uh, to sit in this chapter with me. It is the largest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses in one chapter, this one psalm. And uh, so what I'd like to do today is take a handful of verses. This is gonna be not our typical kind of sermon. I'm gonna be looking at a topic from, from the top down, big picture, and then I wanna do a handful of verses. You might note Psalm 142. Uh, it's not Psalm 143, that was my typo in the bulletin. So it's, it's Psalm 119, 89, 142, and verse 160. Um, along with uh, a bunch of others that I just didn't want to fill your bulletin full of. So, I titled the sermon, How Firm a Foundation. How Firm a Foundation. And I want to deal today with the topic of truth. The topic of truth. You would think that this topic would be um, not requiring its own sermon. But in our day, oh my goodness, it is important not only that we understand this topic clearly, but that we can stand on the truth and defend the truth and, if need be, suffer for the truth. And in order to do that, we need to be able to think rightly about it. And so what I want to do is spend a little time setting up where we're going to go when we land here in Psalm 119. So come with me on a bit of a journey. I want to begin in, your, in your, the back of your bulletin. Um, you'll see the sermon notes. Let's start with the topic here, ever-changing truth. We live in interesting times, my friends. Interesting times. I was struck with the, uh, the dogma of the current administration in the White House and how black and white they see things that just a handful of years back, they were saying the exact opposite, right? And, and, and they're so dogmatic about these things, this topic, that topic, this is, is what marriage is, and this is what is right, and, and everyone should, well, it wasn't all that long ago that our president himself in his own words was saying totally the opposite thing. What happened? What is going on? Either he is right here and wrong here, or he was wrong here and right here, but he can't have been right there and right here. We live in interesting times. Ever-changing truth. Oh, so many calls, young people. You need to be discerning. Listen to the language, listen to the dream, listen to the encouragement to you. Hey, you need to go find your truth. Find your truth. Now, here's what I wanna to call to your attention. The word your. That's the problem at the heart of this. Let's, let's just acknowledge that. Find your truth, believe your truth. Right, so you need to go find your truth, and then when you find it, what, what really works for you, what sounds good, what, what pats you on the back, what warms your heart, right? Then believe it and speak it. Speak your truth. Oh, the last couple of years, we've heard this so much. Remember the first time I heard that, I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> what is speak your truth? It's kind of the same thing as saying speak your mind, but it's, it's like the trump card is when you say truth, speak your truth. Oh, live your truth. Be true to yourself. Maybe that's where this all kind of begins. You decide what you want to do, and then just go do it. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Hmm. Your, your truth, your truth. I remember when I was younger, in uh, high school for example, this is what kind of was popular in my public school. Hey man, you know, I would, I would be sharing my, my faith with my friends and, and, and sharing the gospel. and They'd be like, dude, listen, your truth, that's cool for you. That's good, but don't, don't put it on me. You do you, I'll do me. Your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. We can just get along. Um, the problem is, is we still have this possession issue. Truth is not possessive. It's not mine and it's not yours. It's either true or it's false. This works until uh, someone says this. Well, uh, there is no truth, right? And we, we've pointed out how ironic and inconsistent a claim like that is because it is a truth claim 
to deny truth, uh, which is sort of funny uh, when you think about it. So my truth is my truth, your truth is your truth. That works unless my truth says that, you're, that there is no truth. Then whatever you believe, it, well, it's out because what I believe takes the cake. And, and here's what I wanna say. For people who suggest in this uh, kind of militant tolerance, you could say, there's like a militant tolerance. It's everybody's right, no one's wrong, except for the people who think that anyone's wrong. <laughs> and if you think that I'm wrong. Here's what's amazing about everyone's right. That is a, that's an atheistic claim. It's an atheistic claim. It's basically saying all religions are the same, all religions are equally valid, valid. they're all untrue. That's, that's the part that just finishes that statement. Because you can't say that if one religion is actually true. Some people are right, some people are wrong but we all want the trophy. You must affirm and celebrate my truth as progress. This is more recent, isn't it? This is a new, I would say, that, that militarized tolerance has moved into kind of a new category. It's not enough for you to just leave me alone and let me do me. It's, it's now a requirement for you to celebrate, applaud, attend parades, and teach your kids the truth that I have embodied. This is altogether different. This is, I would call it, the gloves coming off in our day. This is the wrath of God on our nation. The wrath of God. And we've got to be clear, my friends, as the local church in Whatcom County, we need to know who we are how to respond, what, what are we going to do when they come to us and say, hey, do you celebrate? Do you encourage? Do you instruct? Do you sit your children in the, um, the, the schools that are seeking to try to tell them that all of this is good and wonderful and progress? What are we gonna say? What do we do when they come to our church and they say, you can't preach that, pastor? That's inconsistent with what we believe is best, culturally speaking. You're out of step, you're out of line. Or, that's hate speech. That's hate speech. Keyword here is relativism. We've got all R's for keywords today. The first word is relativism. We've got to spot this and call it what it is. Cultural relativism. It is godless. It is godless to the core and it's geniusly so. I mean, it is, it is genius godlessness. It's all relative. Just do your truth. You, know, you figure it out, do whatever you want. That is not reality. Chasing the ever-changing narrative of a godless culture. There are many churches that have given themselves to this. This church is not one. By the grace of God. We're not gonna run that race. We're, we're not gonna spend our time trying to be relevant, trying to keep up with all the fads and the changes and, well, man, now I guess we can't preach about this because this is taboo now to the, to the ears of the people we're trying to reach. Do you remember the sermon I preached on, on Charles Spurgeon? and how significant it was in his evangelism that he did not compromise the truth of God's word, that is more than ever important for this church. Don't pull back from the truth of God's word and call it evangelism. That's not love and that's not faithful witness. We call forward the word of God in love with soft hearts and spines of steel because we love and we care. The evolution of truth in our times is fascinating. It's, it's this word progress. That, that's, you know, this, you know, progressive churches, progressive Christians, it drives me nuts. It's not progress. It's, it's regress. It's compromise to the core. No one's advancing anything. We're, we're going backwards. Well, it's new, so that means it's gotta be better. 
It's got to be improved. It must be more relevant to our time. Young people, listen close. There is in every generation a pride, a pride that will well up and say of parents or grandparents, you guys are old. You're out of touch. Hey, don't, you're not supposed to laugh at that now. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> you're old, you're out of touch. You're archaic, your beliefs, they're dated. You're not in step with the culture. You need to progress. Hmm. Now that may be true on certain things like technology or whatever it is. It takes work to keep up with things like that. But when we're talking about the category of truth, it's dead wrong. It's dead wrong. In fact, I remember John MacArthur saying, if you ever hear a preacher preach a sermon and he says, no one's ever said this before, but I'm gonna say, he's like, he's wrong. <laughs> he's, he's likely a heretic. He's probably wrong. Novel ideas, new ideas that have never been taught tend not to be biblical. Jesus had that kind of authority in his day. We do not. What is truth? Have you ever asked that question? What, what is truth? How would you define it? If you were gonna put a definition to it, how would you define it? Where would you begin? Here's where I think we have to begin. Reality. That's the key word for this. If you're gonna answer the question, what is truth? Remember Pilate. <laughs> think of this, the irony of this. He asks Jesus, what is truth? And then he walks away. The person on the face of the earth most able to fully answer his question, he didn't stop and listen to the answer. What is truth? Truth must connect to reality. Here's what I would say would be helpful definitions. Truth speaks to what is real. I might just jot these down. Truth is what accurately represents reality. So, there are people who choose to live in delusions. They live in lies, not in truth. I could stand up here and tell you that I am a, an orange. I identify as an orange. <laughs> and I want all of you to refer to me, you know, I can't even come up with a weirdness of that. Like, <laughs> I'm not an orange. I am who God has created me to be, and I have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. There is no deeper level of identity than the fact that I have been created, number one, and redeemed, number two. That's who I am. That's truth, that's reality. You see the difference here? So people can say, well you gotta, you gotta come up with your truth, you gotta discover your truth, then you gotta live your truth. Well. If you put a your in front of it, it's most likely not real, not true. We can observe truth and we can discover truth. This is why I love science. I mean, students, listen, science, if it's true and it squares up with this book, it's God's. He knows it, he, he, he created it. We can embrace truth, we can discover it, we can observe it, but we cannot create truth. You realize that. We don't create truth. There is no rightful possessive that precedes truth. I, my, your, no. It's the truth. And if it's the truth, then it's God's truth. My truth versus the truth. That, that may be the biggest difference in our day. There's a huge difference between those two. The truth, it's either true or it's false. No one owns it but God, if it's true. If it's not true, well, maybe we can say my then. God alone is ultimately real. Listen to the logic, how this flows, how the connection here is. God is alone is ultimately real, he is ultimate reality. Why is that? Well, because he's the one that made it all. If it is, 
comes from God, so he is ultimate. That is, no reality was before him. He does not depend upon any other reality. All other reality is created by him, so by his being and his creating, he has determined and defined what is, that is, what is real. Since what makes something true is that it corresponds to what is real, therefore God determines and defines, key word, all truth, all truth. Whether we've discovered it yet or not, God is the one who determines and defines all truth. When God speaks, that is truth, that is truth. So God says, and it is. God says, let there be, as Justin mentioned, and and it is. He speaks into reality. What was not existing, he can say, let there be. When we open our Bibles and the Lord is revealing his word, that is truth, my friends, truth, with a capital T. I like how MacArthur says it. Reality is what it is because God declared it so and made it so. Therefore, God is the author, the source, the determiner, the governor, the arbiter, the ultimate standard, and the final judge of all truth. If you believe that, if that is a part woven deeply into your worldview and and you stand in that place, you are gonna see the world radically differently than the culture around you. There is no progressing, there is no evolution of truth. There's no um, moving from, from this truth to that truth. You are either in the truth or you are not in the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, let's consider this, absolute and unchanging truth. Psalm 119 shows us these things. Key word here is revelation, revelation. So we move from relativism into reality, and how do we get there? We get there through revelation. It's the revelation of God. Listen to these verses. Psalm 119, 89 uh, and into 90. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed In the heavens, your faithfulness endures to all generations. It's amazing here how your word and your faithfulness are are functioning basically like synonyms. His word is so true, it's the same as his faithfulness. It's fixed, it's settled, it's firm, it's not changing. It's not in danger. It's never out of date. Catch the word, forever forever. We were talking at the campsite on Friday night and and Rachel said, we'll likely be studying the Bible throughout all eternity. And I wholeheartedly agree. You know why? Because it doesn't become irrelevant even on the new heaven and the new earth. It is as relevant then as it is today. Forever, O Lord, your word, your word, that's the right possessive, It's his word. It's his work as it is that speaks, that reveals, that creates, defines, and declares what is true to all generations. I asked the question of those we were camping with there on Friday night, what is it that we long for the generations that would follow us, let's say in 100 years? What what do we long for them to say was true of us today? this year, in the next 20, 30 years? What is it that we would long to hear them say, oh God, we praise you for those who went before us, for when they progressed with the times. They were so relevant and loved and applauded by the godless culture of their day. Is that our our longing? No, the very first word that that came was faithful, faithful. Why is that so fitting? 
because his word is fixed, it's firmly fixed, it's never out of date. Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is righteous forever. That, that is so cool. That is not what President Biden has just demonstrated. You see what I mean? Oh, the, the shifting, changing, fluid nature of quote unquote truth in our day. And morals and ethics, they all just, they're all over the place. But the righteousness of the God who is, is righteous forever. He doesn't need to progress with the times. It's true today, it's eternally true all the way back and it will forever be true. What is righteous today is going to be righteous a thousand years from now. We need to know this, we need to love this. There is such simplicity. Oh, I was talking with someone the other day. The, the, the righteous call of God to his people is such a simple life. It's so simple to just say, Lord, I love your word. I, love, I wanna obey your word. I wanna walk in the light. I just wanna obey you. Show me, help me, lead me on. Your law is true. Fact, your law is true. His law reveals his righteousness. Remember this? Leviticus, Romans, everything in between. Your law is your revelation of truth, what is true, what is right. It's the revelation of God himself. And then this one, Psalm 160, uh, 119, 160. The sum of your word is truth. What a cool way to talk about it. You go to the forest and you walk up to a tree and you say, this tree is true. And then you get in a helicopter and you fly up to 30,000 feet. Can you do that in a helicopter? Maybe? Where's Dan? Can you do that? Maybe a little too high. Okay. <laughs> Let's say 20,000 feet. You go straight up that one tree, now you see a forest. True. True. So the tree is true. That one verse in the word of God is true. You pull back and you look at the totality of it, cover to cover, every word, every verse, true. It's true. And it's enduring. Every one, every single one of your righteous rules endures forever. It's never outdated. It's never old fashioned. It's never irrelevant. I fought that battle a lot in California. There's a lot of people that were working so hard to be relevant. They bought me flip-flops to preach in. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I'm thinking to myself, have you seen my feet? I mean, <laughs> you don't want that to happen. <laughs> the sum of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Do you feel this? Do you feel the simplicity and the, the majesty of the word of God? <clears throat> his revelation comes in his creation, right? We saw this in Romans 1. What can be known about God is plain to them. It's evident through what has been seen, right? His power, his attributes. Oh, it's beautiful. His revelation is given in his word and his revelation is given in his son. And if we ever pit one of these against the other, we fail, we lose. The people in our day that say, <clears throat> you know, I, I just love Jesus, but I'm not a real fan of that book of his. You know the one that, that he wrote? <laughs> I'll take Jesus, but I don't really trust his word. We fail, we fail there. How are you gonna take Jesus if you can't take his word? His word is true. Every single word is true. Isaiah declared this, Isaiah 40, uh, 6b to 8, all flesh is grass. Don't get, I mean, don't miss this now. All flesh is grass, that's us. That's us, everybody in here, young and old. We're grass. And all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. 
Be humbled. Little man, we are grass. You ever picked flowers, put them in a vase? You blink, and there's stuff all over your counter. That's you. That's me. The grass withers, and the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Think of all the arrogance of man. Think of all these truth claims, these denials of God's word, these, 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 these theories that, that take triumph over the God who has revealed and spoken as if somehow they know what God does not. That we could stand over this book in judgment and say, well, that's just not relevant for our day. We've moved past that. Heaven and earth, Jesus said, will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Ha <laughs> ha, I love it. So we have a choice. We can go with God's divine revelation or we can throw ourselves into the shifting sand and the tossing seas of philosophies and ideologies and theories and speculations and criticisms and trends and fads narratives and talking points. Friends, we were there. We were there. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd still be there, wouldn't we? The grace of God that opened our eyes to see the glory of Christ, to to be drawn to the truth of his word. This is the work of grace, the work of God. Let us not then fall back into the pit of ever-changing truth. Let's stand on the word of God. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for rescue to Jesus have fled. God's word is absolutely and eternally true. Resolve this in your mind, friends. Resolve this in your mind. This is fact. This is fact because there is a God and he has spoken. Okay? Now, if that's true, then then we can conclude this. There is never anything more relevant than the truth of God's word. Never. You don't have to spend time chasing the, the latest narrative of a godless culture. You can focus your attention on the God who spoke and oh, how we have tasted of the relevancy of his word. How he does it is beyond me. So many times I plan these sermons way out and then the day that I preach them, it's just like, that was perfect timing, Lord. We did not, I couldn't have planned that. And he brings it right as as we need it. Grace for today, here's your bread. It's good. Let's eat. Sustain your soul. Strengthen your muscles. The word of God is ever relevant. And so we join with the theme of Psalm 119. Where did the psalmist become this kind of man? I I just love to read Psalm 119. If you struggle to pursue the word of God, Start in Psalm 119. And pray as you read through and meditate and memorize those verses. Lord, make my heart like this man's heart for your word. I love your word. Listen, listen to this. Now this is, this is gonna be a, a, a three key words, okay? So I added a few. Read, renew, rejoice. The, the God of all of creation wrote a book And we have it. So read it. Read it. Renew your minds as you do. Oh, Lord, renew my mind. May my thinking be in line with your thinking. May I never stand in judgment over your truth. I want your truth to be what I believe and build my life upon. Make it the foundation of my life. 
and then rejoice, like the psalmist in Psalm 119. Listen to the echo of these words. In the way of your testimonies, O oh Lord, I delight. As much as in all riches, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. That's one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. It's one of the reasons we named our daughter Grace Delight. Grace Delight Pickens. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Look at his goal. Lord, bless me so that I can keep pursuing your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things out of your law. What a prayer to pray as you sit down in the morning with your Bible. What a prayer to pray as you sit here on Sunday mornings and we say, open your Bibles. Oh Lord, here we go. Open my eyes to the wonders that are within this incredible book of your revelation for me. He goes on, lead me in the path of your commandments for I delight in it, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. In the morning when you rise, there is a battle for your focus, for your attention. It's a battle, if you have a phone especially, we all fight this. A battle to get to the book. Get to the book. Now, we don't have to be legalistic. You can check your email real quick while you're sipping your coffee, whatever. But don't allow your phone to steal you away from this book. Get to the book. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. This is life. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. How sweet are your words to my taste. They're sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding and I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Friends, if you want to hate your sin more, then read this book. Dig in this book. If you want to stand firm and, 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 and find strength to fight against temptation, then live in this book. If you want to shine bright in a culture that is darker than ever, be a Bible person each day. So, why don't you pull out this little insert that we gave you. You see that in there? Where did mine go? Oh, I've got one, I've got it. Yeah. Jenny and I were working on this and we, I just, I'm so excited about this. We came up with a, uh, a two-sided uh, little insert for your Bible. It's like a little bookmark, okay? And one of the sides says expositional preaching. That's what I do most weeks, week after week, right? We take a book. We start at the beginning. We preach every single verse until we finish. And then we celebrate and we say, okay, we're going Old Testament. So then we go to Old Testament. We do the same thing. Then we come back New Testament. And over time, our strategy is do every book, the same way, we want to move through every book. We're 14 years in, so if, you, if you've been at this church for the last 14 years, then um, there are different locations. There's one in the pass-through here, there's one on the bulletin board, and one on the sign-up table. Our preaching history is documented by date, and you can go and you can fill this out. Please use blue or black ink, right? <laughs> no hanging chads, okay? And you can fill that in, or if you want, you could start now. Um, or if you could start with Romans. But the, the idea here is, is that you are on a journey. And your goal is, Lord, I want to sit in your word every single part of it. I want to sit under your word. And so you can track that journey here. Fill it out, put the date maybe when we do it, and then flip it over. On the other side is personal Bible study. And this I've found tremendously helpful. I've been doing this for many, many years. Just make a note when you read a book and you study it through. So you go Old Testament and you've got, you've got that line there and then New Testament and you'll be able to see if you're a little too heavy on the New Testament, then you can do a few more Old Testament back and forth. Um, read them through, maybe a chapter a day. Study it through, take your time. You don't have to rush. 
I told people, I've never read the Bible in a year. Not saying it's a bad thing to do, I just can't read that fast. I'm slower. It takes time for me to process and think. But this will track your journey at a glance then. So you start a new book, finish, you know, fill in the one you just finished. This is such a good help in daily devotion study. We're people of the word, a people of the word. So delight like the psalmist delights in the word of God daily and come and sit and journey with us together in the work of preaching. We're going to the Old Testament. We're gonna do some minor prophets. Then we're gonna come back to the New Testament, do 2 Peter. Then we're jumping back to the Old Testament and we're gonna do the, uh, the book of Daniel. Is that what I said, Daniel? And then uh, New Testament, 1 Timothy, and then Old Testament. I mean, it's on the chart. You'll see where we're headed. I'm stoked, we're going, I got the plan laid out through 2025, Um, I can't wait. And we get to do this together. So we'll track our journey through here together. Little things like that will help fan the flame of consistency and pursuit of God in his word. What a journey it's been, what a joy. Okay, now in conclusion, I want to ask this question. What's in a name? What's in a name? Only 20% of Americans believe the Bible is the actual word of God. That's a new study that came out just this week. 20%, okay? One in five Americans. That includes our county, okay? That includes the churches probably in our county. Many, many people who would consider themselves Christians, even, are not confident that the Bible is actually the word of God. Hmm. Good Shepherd Community Church is our name. Good Shepherd Community Church. The church was formed from a merger that took place between two churches, Bethany Baptist Church and... um, uh, Center Point Community Church. They formed together and, uh, and came together as Good Shepherd Community Church. Here's what I'd like to do. I wanna ask you, what is a community church? If you had to, to give an answer to that, what is a community church? Why do we have that in our name? I'll give you a little history here. A community church, historically, was known uh, in this way. Uh, as people uh, migrated to the, the nation here, they tended to come in groups, um, denominational kind of affiliations, and so they would come into a town, and you would come to a small town, and you would say, well, hey, you know, I'm a Methodist. I need a Methodist church, and so the Methodist church would pop up. They'd have a small number of people, and then a, a Baptist church would pop up, usually First Baptist, right? They claim it, First. And then a Presbyterian church and a Catholic church, and so in a small town, you would have a bunch of these different churches, denominational churches. Over time, as population swelled and decreased, there were situations that arise where all of a sudden there wasn't enough people in these towns to maintain, to sustain all of these churches. So they would come together, consolidate, and form a community church. A commu- that's how community churches historically became known. In a quest for unity, each group would compromise on some doctrinal or practical point that would cause division with the other group. As a result, many community churches had very loosely defined beliefs and allowed wide variations of belief among their members. Okay? Now, in the 14 years that I've been here, I have battled, along with the elders, we have battled this this preconceived notion because of our name that, that that's us, that, that, that that's who we are. Good Shepherd Community Church. Oh, I see, well you're, so you guys kind of do a little bit of everything. No, no, that's not who we are. And to be clear, not every community church does that. But there is still a very strong message that is sent by this word. Are we a community? Absolutely we are. In Christ, we're a community. The problem is, is that that word doesn't really describe us. Is is that who we are? Do we want to be affiliated with that kind of past? I would say that's not who we are. 
It really isn't. It doesn't describe us. This is who we are. We're the 20%. That's who we are, friends. So last month I went to the elders and I, I brought this up. It's been on my mind for many, many years. I just feel like there's, there's a thing that we could do that would make this better, that would strengthen, it would communicate more clearly. I suggested that we consider renaming our church Good Shepherd Bible Church. Good Shepherd Bible Church. We talked about it, and to a man, we went around the table, and all of the elders were like, that's who we are. That's, that describes us. And so, we'd like to propose to the congregation to uh, confirm God's leading in our midst. We all agree that this is it's time to make a name change for our church. Um, on August 7th, we'd like to call the members to just confirm God's leading by a vote of affirmation for that. Um, and we just ask you to pray about that. If you have questions about that, come and talk to the elders. Um, we love the Good Shepherd, right? You can't improve on that. Good Shepherd, he is the focal point of all of the verses of Scripture. He is the reason that we are here today. So we love that we start there. I can't wait to, to move through the Gospel of John. Jenny and I are writing the study right now, and we, we moved through these verses recently. Oh, I am the Good Shepherd. All of the imagery that goes with that. But then how much better is it to communicate to our, to our people, both out there as they're checking us out on YouTube or, or, or on, the, on the internet, you know, just on our website. Well, who are these people? Well, from the very beginning, the statement is clear. We're Bible people. That's who we are. We're Bible people. We're standing on the word. So be praying about that. Um, you've got four weeks. Talk to the elders if you have questions or reservations. We'd love to, to, to help you and answer uh, those questions. And then uh, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll do a vote, okay? So it's at 1030, August 7th, in between services. Just a quick little vote, and we'll trust the Lord to lead and guide us in that, okay? So it seems like kind of a small thing uh, to some, I know. But this is a statement, both to our current culture and generation and to the generations that would follow us. We're Bible people. So let's be the 20%. Our response this morning, friends, the God of all the universe wrote a book. Just stop and consider that. Is that amazing? Okay, I mean, I know Hillary wrote a book. <laughs> That's not amazing. I didn't buy that one. <laughs> Lots of people have written a book. Stop and consider this. The God who is, the great I am, has loved us such that he would give this book to us that we might know him and trust him, be saved by him. And so this week, put it to work. Put it to work. Don't let it gather dust. Don't let it be an afterthought. Build your life on this book. It is true with a capital T. It is our joyful pursuit. Every day, Lord, I want to know you more. I want, I want, I want to know you so I read. I, I want to love you more. I want to know who I am, what you have done to save me and all that that means. I want to cling to your promises. I want to tell other people who you are. Not from my opinion, but from your word that is true. This is our opportunity this week. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your word. We love it. We love it. It has so shaped us, and it shapes us every day. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes down to the very deepest parts of us, and it reveals that which needs to be addressed. Oh Lord, you cut like a surgeon with a blade to carve out that which is bad and ugly and sinful and wrong, and you reveal the darkness to heal us and to, to make us strong, to, to help us grow. Thank you, Spirit, for the work that you do as we study your word. We delight in you, the, the God of the word, and oh Lord, make us a people of your word more and more that the generations that follow would, would look at, at this moment in our history and say, Lord, we praise you for their faithfulness to your word. 
even when the culture around them, the four out of five, turned away from it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.